Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with Kim Strassel and Kyle Peterson with the Potomac Watch podcast. And let's listen to Bernie Sanders talk about how much he's behind Joe Biden. If he runs on a strong progressive agenda, he's not only going to win, he's going to win by a strong vote. And I'll tell you why. Because when you look at a Republican Party, it's not only that you have a president, a, a former president who has been impeached twice, indicted four times. These are people who deny women in this country the right to control their own bodies. Really? Is that where we are in 2023? Not recognizing the reality of climate change, wanting more tax breaks for billionaires? That's what their agenda is. So I think that in any kind of serious campaign, President Biden and the Democrats will do quite well against that reactionary agenda. Uh, leave aside uh, Bernie's, uh, how should we say, tendentious caricature of what Republicans believe. It's still pretty significant, I think, Kim, that Bernie is uh, endorsing Biden with so much enthusiasm and so early, because it means there's going to be no serious challenge to Biden from the left as long as Biden is going to continue running. I think Robert Kennedy Jr. is not that serious candidate. So why is Bernie putting all his chips down on Joe? <laughs> By the way, listening to that gave me sort of horrible flashbacks of following him on the 2020 campaign trail. Look, he's doubling down on Joe Biden because Joe Biden has essentially adopted Bernie Sanders's platform, his agenda. I mean, never forget what happened here. Joe Biden went into that primary. He won it by promising that he would not be Bernie Sanders. You know, remember those South Carolina voters? They finally stood up and said, we, we can't take the risk of putting a progressive at the top of the ticket. Uh, the party united around Joe Biden, who claimed to be the moderate in the field, the uniter of the country, that he was going to run on this somewhat modest agenda of healing the divide in the nation and fixing COVID. And then immediately, upon winning the nomination, sat down and created a unity task force with Bernie Sanders' team, adopted pretty much the entirety of Bernie's agenda, and has very much focused since then, not on uniting the country, but on uniting the Democratic Party, doing anything that progressives ask him to do. So whether that is embracing student loan forgiveness or the Green New Deal or embracing record spending. I mean, Bernie hasn't got everything he wants. His ambitions are much bigger than even that. But he's got a lot more than he might have expected from this president. Well, I think he got – I disagree with you a bit. I think that uh, he at least got Biden to propose most of what he wanted. A lot of what yeah. didn't pass was because of the two senators he directly criticized, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, not elsewhere in that Sunday interview. And I think one of the things that he is – hoping for here. He's bidding for a big win in 2024, as he says, so that Democrats retake the House and they keep the Senate with a majority that's different than there is now. So Manchin, I think he figures, will be gone, beaten by a Republican in West Virginia. And Kirsten Sinema is facing a, a liberal Democrat and maybe Carrie Lake on the Republican side or Blake Masters, two demonstrated losers in that state, election losers. So he's basically saying we can run the table here and maybe have a, a, a really big moment in 2025, Kyle. Yeah, he says explicitly, give me 50 real Democrats in the Senate, not this uh, this mansion guy and this cinema lady. And I think there is something to be learned from Bernie's tactical moderation here because one of the planks that he became famous for and sort of unilaterally injected into the discourse is Medicare for all, his bill that would make private health insurance essentially illegal. And obviously that has not come to pass under President Biden. But Bernie is more than happy to take, for example, price controls on prescription drugs in Medicare. And I think that is a real difference in how he has operated as somebody who wants policies that are not politically feasible at the moment with some Republicans. I mean, often you have Republican factions 
that end up slowing down things like keeping the government open because they want something that is not going to pass the current Senate and the current House. And Bernie's strategy in that sort of situation is to argue publicly uh, outside of Congress for Medicare for all, for going whole hog with the kind of independent Vermont socialism that he imagines for the country, but then inside to vote for the bill, the ugly compromise that gets an incremental gain in his direction. And I think he's operated like that for a long way. And there, there's something, frankly, that Republicans can learn from that. Worth watching as we go ahead. Let's talk briefly about Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, has frozen twice before the cameras in the last six weeks or so, and leading to a lot of speculation that after his concussion in March, which included a fairly extensive recovery, he may not be able to serve out his term as leader or through the his Senate term, which runs to 2026. Mr. McConnell was at pains this week to say, forget about that. I'm serving out uh, this term as leader and for this Congress, and then I'm going to serve the rest of my Senate term as well. And Republicans, Kim, seem to be falling in line behind him, except for, I guess, Rand Paul, who's uh, the fellow Kentucky senator who's griping, that's what Rand Paul does, about this or that. And Josh Hawley, who doesn't like McConnell at all and voted against him for leader. But neither Paul nor Hawley have a real carry inside the Republican Senate conference. So there's real no threat to Mr. McConnell's leadership as long as, in my view, he doesn't have more such episodes. Yeah, I think that's right. McConnell gets a lot of credit because for all the carping that goes on and griping, especially from Donald Trump and others, within the Republican caucus, he's maintained really pretty good ties. He's also got a a good leadership team around him that are very loyal. And the reports are too that, I mean, we, we don't know exactly what these episodes are, but talking to other people who have said this publicly and, and in, in my own chats with them say that these seem to be isolated at the moment and he's functioning very well in meetings just as he always has. Age is certainly something that affects us all and he did have that very nasty concussion. Hopefully he is recovering from it, but at the moment there doesn't seem to be any threat to his leadership in part because I think a lot of Republicans also have some admiration for some of his positions and leadership over the years too. And this is a bit of a testimony to that. All right. We'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, uh, Kyle Peterson. Thank you, Kim Strassel. Thank you all for listening. We're here every day on Potomac Watch, and hope you'll be joining us uh, tomorrow and every day here. Thanks for listening.